So I talked about the DDL. I believe this is pretty much where I cut off with you guys. And what's happening, like I said, over the next three weeks, three and a half weeks, just before the Christmas break, um, is we are going to cover uh, the SQL language. The SQL language, as I spoke before, our little interruption, is the programming language, I hate, I'm using the word programming loosely here, is the computer language used to communicate with the database server. And it is used in a variety of ways, whether you're typing in the commands manually or you wrote it as part of your code in an application. It's That's what it's used like. It's a very English-like language, so if your English is good, fantastic. If your English is not good, that might be rough. But that's life. Um, because even if English is not your language, SQL is still in English no matter where you, where you are in the world. Um, and I also usually describe the SQL language as being an odd one where pretty much every piece of language seems to have been designed by someone different. And they all sat in separate rooms and didn't communicate until they decided they were done. And we've been living with some that weird quirkness ever since. Um, it is not a brutally hard language, but it is a fairly um, memorization heavy language, as in either you remember the syntax or you don't. And what's the golden rule if you don't remember how what the syntax is for something? Google it. Um, so you can Google the syntax if you don't remember the specific syntax as you go. I still Google certain things all the time. There's just some things I just don't remember off the top of my head. For example, I want to convert a date to a string and format it a certain way. I never remember what the arguments are. Why? Because I got my portable memory bank called Google. That's just life. Um, but the first part of the SQL language is known as the DDL, the Data Definition Language. And it's made up of three commands, create, alter, and drop. Create allows you to make things, alter lets you change them, dropping is you get rid of them like a bad boyfriend. Because they're gone and you never see them again. Now, when you create, the syntax is, like I said, it's syntax odd, uh, but it follows a fairly s standard pattern for every kind of object you create. Basically, you create database objects, and you have to say, you're going to create what? So if you create a table, create a view, create a function, uh, create all kinds of other things you can create, then you give it a name, because everything in a database server must have a name. And then you give it the definition. So you create what? Give it a name, then you give it its definition. And depending on what it is you're creating, the part that's in brackets that says definition changes. So the first part everybody agreed to, and then everybody else were sitting in separate rooms saying, I'm going to create a table, so this is the syntax I'm going to use. I'm going to create a view, this is the syntax I'm going to use. I'm going to create an index, I'll use a syntax that makes absolutely no sense. And then they all got together and said, cool, I like your idea, we'll keep them the way they are. So. The most common one you're going to use, however, is create table. And this is the syntax for creating a table. Like I said before, you create, what do you create a table? What is it called? In this case, it's a table called test, so create table test. You open up the brackets, and then you get define your fields. You guys know these as attributes and or fields, because I talked about both. And you define, you give it the name of the field the data type of the field, and any other attributes. As in, is it a primary key? Is it not null? Or you can even feed it a default value. You'll notice, comma delimited, list, create table test, open bracket, now we add an ID, a name, and an active field, close bracket, semicolon, and then you run it. Now on this slideshow, which is actually is on Blackboard, I double checked really quick on the way by. Uh, it is there, there's a link to the actual syntax. Uh, if I went through the entire syntax for create tables uh, for Postgres, we'd spend probably two lectures on it. It is probably printed about 25 pages long. This example covers 95% of what you ever need to do with it. The rest of the stuff is specialization extra tweaks, uh, shortcuts, other data types, 
stuff like that where there's things that are specific to what you're trying to do, which 90% of the time, 95% of the time, something like this will do the job just fine. As long as you remember this rough uh, structure, you'll do just great. Okay. Now, I'm not going into the, I'm not even giving you guys an example of the alter command. Uh, why? Because depending on what you're altering, the syntax changes. Also, alter, and I try to teach this course server agnostic, mostly. And the problem is that the alter command is different on Postgres than it is on Oracle, than it is on MySQL, than it is on Microsoft SQL Server. They have some very common parts, but they have all their own little quirks to it. So you're better off not tying yourself to a specific, um, what's what I'm looking for, a specific interpretation of it and just to learn what it does. So then you can look it up based on what you're working against. Um, but alter is used to change the definition of objects. Um, when you're working with tables, which is most commonly what you're going to be using it for, you can add, rename, remove fields, set defaults, change the data types. Let's say you have a, t a field that's set up as an integer and you realize you now need decimal places. You can change that field so now it's a numeric. And if you're lucky, you won't lose the numbers that are in there now. Uh, if you work with MySQL, you got a 55th chance of losing the numbers, uh, depending which way you're going. Some unknown reason it doesn't like transferring between certain data types. Uh, going from a numeric to a float, funny things happen. Uh, you'll go from 3.33 to 3.33 ad infinitum. Why? MySQL. Um, again, the syntax varies object. If you want to go look it up, I provide a link in the slideshow. I will be doing some quick examples of this in a moment. All right, the next one is drop. And it's the easiest one to remember. It's the same syntax for almost everything. There's a few exceptions to the rule, as always. Just like the English language, there's always a few exceptions to the rule. Well, actually, there's almost every piece of language is an exception to the rule. And this is fairly straightforward. Drop, and you give it a name. So if you create a table called test, you go drop table. You just go literally drop test. Gone. Um, that depends on the database server. Some of them you want makes you want to actually identify what kind of object you're dropping. So it'd be drop space table space test. Semicolon. Uh, the fully defined one where you describe the name of the object every single time is universally accepted. So as a rule of thumb, you're better off using the longer version of the syntax, which is drop space, whatever it is you're trying to drop space, the name of the object. And therefore it'd be drop table test. Um, what, why is that a good thing? Uh, because depending on the database server, you can have the same name for more than one kind of object. You could have an index called test, and you could have a table called test. Therefore, if you go drop test, how does it know which one you're going to do? It's like going to do one of two things. It's actually going to give you an error, or it's going to blow up and delete everything. So you're better off being precise anyways. Okay. No, went over there, did it. I've got a database called test. It's an empty database. There's nothing in it, just so you know. Can I make that any bigger? There we go. OK, so I'm going to do a quick example of create table. And I'm also going to do a quick example of alter the table. Then I'm going to drop the table so you guys can see. But I won't do the drop table right away because I need it for a few other examples. So the syntax is create table. And what's the next argument? We give it a name. I'm going to call it example. Why? Because it's an example. Ah the heck? 
swear I hadn't typed in a week. Holy cow. Okay, that's not completely mangled. All right, so as I said before, create table, you give it a name, open up a bracket, and then inside of that you'll have the definition of the fields. Uh, first field is ID because that's our primary key. And we're making it a big serial so it auto increments. We've discussed this already weeks ago. If you don't remember, go look at your notes. Um, and it's a primary key. Now, when I use primary key here, this is the shortcut to creating a primary key, just so you know. Um, this is the old syntax from years Perfectly valid. There is an alternate way of creating a, the primary key, and you create the table first, then you add a constraint to the table that's a primary key. I've never been a fan of that structure myself because it's two steps to do one job. And personally, I find the fact that the word primary key is right next to the field really intuitive. This ID is a primary key. Bang. As opposed to I create a table with ID and name, and after the fact we're going to make ID a primary key later on, which seems to be a little meh. Now I'm going to add a name field. If I can actually type. I'm going to make this one not null. You guys know what not null means? See, I can't see what's there here. So I'm typing blind, and apparently my hands are not cooperating today. Can you tell I haven't been actually programming at work this last two weeks? I've been fixing people's computers. Because there are internal tech support guys on vacation. So I, I'm fixing people's computers instead. So, not null. You guys know what not null means? It means it is a required value. It means it cannot be null. You've got to give it something. You can feed it an empty string because that's not null. Null is absence of value. All right. So, nope. Now, this is going to generate an error, and I'll, I'll run it so you see the error, because part of this is I want to show you guys the error messages you may experience as you do this. But there will be an error message. Okay. Now, I can't make this pane any bigger. It's a syntax error near a bracket. And the good news is this editor has actually gotten enough smarts in the last iteration that it actually starts highlighting when things have gone wrong. See this underlined green here and that white dot? It says there's an error near this. Now... Usually when you see this kind of error message, it means the mistake is before it. Right before that moment. And what is the mistake? We got one too many commas. You cannot have a comma on your last line of your definition. So if I do this, it'll work. And it's just important to know these error messages and not to panic when you see them. It means that you made a typo somewhere. And you just need to go through it again. And the last line of your table definition cannot have a comma. So there's no comma before the closing bracket. And I'm going to run it, and hopefully this time I don't have a mistake, an error. Yay. No mistakes. I created a table, have two fields, ID and name. One's a varchar 50. The other one's a big serial. Now let's just say after I just created this table, I realized I forgot to add something to it. And that happens more than you know. It happened to me like last week. I finished a project and the guy said, you forgot to add this field. Oh, okay. So, alter table example. Have you noticed I wrote alter table lowercase? I'm just trying to demonstrate the SQL language is not case sensitive on the syntax keywords. The, the actual object name, such as example, is case sensitive. Just so you know. The rest of it is not. Now, you can even get fancy and go start mix casing everywhere and it won't care. Now I'm going to add a column to this. I'm going to alter the table example. I'm going to add a column called email. Varkar150. Then that's how you add a column to a table. And I'm actually going to add a second one.
like such. And I'm going to run it. No error messages. As you can see, you can run more than one statement at once. Now, this table has two extra email columns. Well, it has two email columns. And I'm going to run a quick command to show you guys that, that it really is there. Uh, this is the primary subject of the rest of this term is this one command. You can see here, ID name, email, and email2. Now let's say we realize we made a mistake and email2 shouldn't have happened. What do we do? Is we want to drop the column. You drop the column. In MySQL, it's, the syntax is slightly different. This is why I don't write the syntax in the, the slide because you may need to go look it up for yourselves. But if I want to get rid of a column, it's alter table, drop column, name of the column. You hit the run button, and it's gone. So if I change that back to Now you see it's gone from here. Now, here's a quick tip. Wait a second. Here's a quick tip in case you're working on your labs and you can't remember what command what you just did. This history tab is fantastic. It shows you everything you did, including the error messages you got. So if you do an entire lab and you forget what you just did, or if you got the copy paste or whatever, you can pull it out of the log or out of the history. Now, if you close this window, the history's gone. Just putting it out there, the history's gone. You had a question. Uh, delete is for the data inside the table, not for, okay. All right, now I'm gonna go back to the slideshow for a bit. Which brings me to uh, the next part of the language, DML. So basically you've seen me create a table, you've seen me change the table. Realistically, that's the most common use for those commands. Uh, DML is where the meat and potatoes of the database happen. The example I like to use is, how often can you build your house? Once. You can make changes to the rooms, change the doors, you know, repaint the house, that kind of stuff. But essentially, the house is there. What the DML does is putting people in and out of the house, or putting the furniture in and out of the house, depending on which example you want to do. The furniture you can change whenever you want. People in your house you can theoretically change whenever you want. Um, most of the time, anyways. Uh, but you can, that's something that turns over several times. Like, we're the fourth owners on our house. Which means this house has been through four sets of families in the last 65 years. And it just goes on and on, right? Because the people change, but the structure of the house does not. So the database structure doesn't change, but the contents change. And part of the language you use to modify the contents is known as DML, Data Manipulation Language. It's made up of four, sort of five commands. Now, the top four commands, there's an acronym called CRUD. CRUD stands for Create, Retrieve, Update, and Delete. Okay? In database land, it's known as Insert, Update, Delete, and Select. It comes out in a different order, but it's the same thing. Insert, you're adding data. Update, you're changing the data. Delete, take a guess what that's going to do. It deletes the data. Select allows you to see the data that's in it. And you've already seen me run a select statement on that form. I was showing you guys, proving you guys the table was created. And then there's this guy, truncate. Now, truncate does roughly the same thing as delete, except if delete's a pellet gun, truncate is a Gatling gun. Uh, truncate is very, very dangerous. Um, it was recently added, recently added to the SQL language officially. Uh, by recently, I mean like 10 or 15 years ago. This language has been around for 30 years. 
Uh, it was never added officially because a lot of the people behind the standards thought it was too dangerous to add as an official thing, even though every database server had it. The delete deletes single rows of data one at a time. Even if you tell it to delete everything in the table, it does it one row at a time. So in other words, I go, okay, I'm going to delete the students in this room. I go delete star from students. You get deleted. You get deleted. You get deleted. You get deleted. One at a time through everybody in the room. Truncate, on the other hand, is I essentially make everybody in this room disappear instantly. Right? You're not being deleted as an ask to leave the room. Literally, I take this room and everybody just disappears. Um, for example, if you were to delete a million rows of data, it could take a couple of minutes to delete a million rows of data. Truck it will do it in about 10 milliseconds. Uh, what does it actually do? Um, it actually essentially tells the database server this table is empty. This table has no data. Then the database server says, okay, I'm good with that. Um, like I said, it's dangerous because there's something else with databases that a lot of people don't understand. There's no one do. And since truncate is so fast, you'll hit the word truncate, space name the table, you hit enter, and you go, oh shit, that was the wrong command. And the data's gone. You make it sound like I've never done this. I've done this. That's how I know how to recover from a backup really, really fast while nobody's actually noticing. Turn off the web server, recover from the backup, turn the web server back on. Nobody noticed anything went wrong. Truncate is dangerous. Um, the good news is if you have a properly structured database with referential integrity rules, RI rules, uh, usually a truncate won't let you nuke stuff that has child records unless you tell it to. And then not only does it nuke the, that record, it nukes out the entire family too. It wipes everything. Uh, it's really fun and really dangerous. And every command has a different syntax. Why? Because all the pocket protectors were sitting in different rooms. Now, the insert command is the first one I'm going to look at. The insert command was created to add data to the database. What is the syntax? You insert into a table. By the way, those angle brackets, less than, greater than signs, you don't put those there. I'm putting that to denote you need to substitute this part. Brackets, a list of columns. Then you give it a list of values. Now, what's kind of nifty about insert statements is, let's say your table has 10 columns. You don't need to supply 10 columns. You only need to supply values for the required columns. So earlier when I created my table, I made name be not null. Name is required. Email I left to be null. So it's optional. And I will demonstrate what this does to you guys. And if you really want to see the syntax for it, again, I provided a link. Yes, it's for Postgres 9.5. Postgres 9.6 is the current stable. 10 is on beta. The syntax, I could have pulled up the page from version 8 and it still would have been more than adequate. It hasn't changed. Now, what does the insert statement actually look like for you guys? So these are what we have. So if we go, what the heck? I misspelled my name, but that's okay. Okay, so earlier I said I must supply a value for name because I made it not null. So I'm going to run this command, and it ran. Yay for us. No errors. Now you're probably going to say, well, can you prove to me it worked? And if you guys don't actually ask that question, you'll be the first group that didn't have someone ask me prove to me that it worked. There I am. I've been added. So 
I didn't did this. Now, let's just say I want to insert just into the email field. Remember I said name was required? If I try to put something in the email field, like that, I'm just going to take this out for a second. Then I'm going to hit run. I'll get an error message. Why? Not a null value in column name violates not null constraint. Name was marked as being not null. That means you've got to give it a value. Postgres's error messages are pretty good. They actually tell you what you did wrong most of the time. Unless is you got a mistake near this. That still means you're close to where you're supposed to be. So if you see not a uh, null value in column, whatever it's called, violates not null constraint, that means you forgot to supply a required value. It's fairly straightforward. I will f amend my statement. And I'll demonstrate something else that's kind of cool. The order of the columns is not important. As long as the values match. So if you list email name at the top, more are going in. It's almost as if I told you guys, okay, you got a square hole and a round hole, and I give you two blocks to try to put the round peg into the square hole and put the square peg into the round hole. It's not going to work, but if you flip them around, they will. And this can be misleading because if all your fields are varchar fields, suddenly what are you going to get? It'll still accept them because it's just strings going into strings, text going into text areas. But when you start messing with numbers and try to feed letters into a number field, it's going to say, no, 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 no. Think again. That's not allowed. And as we can see, that worked. So here's a, that's our insert statement. And go. There's my two rows I created. So the first one doesn't have an email address, the second one does. Like I said, I wish I could make the bottom pane bigger, but I can't. Go figure. Um, however, that's how that's done. Now, the next command is update. Update is used to change the data in a field. And the syntax is update, whatever the table is, set field equals value and you can do more than one field at once and you just comma delimit them so you know field equals value comma field equals value comma and then at the end you see this thing called a where condition and the where condition covers um, which ones you want to modify usually I talk about where when I talk about the select statements uh, but it's basically you guys learned what an if statement is did you guys learn what if was in Java class? Okay. You're going to learn what a conditional is in this class first, apparently. Um, yeah. So you guys, do you guys know anything about Boolean logic? Yes. This expression evaluates to true or false. In this SQL, the uh, equivalency operator is actually one single equal sign, not two equal signs. Not equals applies, greater than or equal to applies, less than or equal to applies. And we have diamond, a diamond operator, which is what we used to have before we had not equal. Because it's impossible for something to be greater than and less than at the same time. So back in the day, we didn't have exclamation mark equals. We actually had diamond. Go figure. So update, whatever it's called, set, whatever, where. Now, what's important about the where clause is when the where clause is used, if you don't use the where clause, in other words, you're not specifying a specific row of data or a specific set of data, what's going to happen? You're going to update everything gets it. Thus, where clauses are important. You'll cut your teeth on where clauses using um, the select statements. 
And again, I've provided a link to the update syntax for Postgres. So when I, when I look at this field, you'll notice a few uh, this data, you'll notice a few things. ID 1 is Dan. ID 3 is Dan G. Somebody might be asking, well, where did, what happened to 2? Remember when I ran it and I got an error? By the time I try to insert the data, it's already grabbed the next value for that field. And if an error happens, that value has already been used anyways. Um, anybody here ever go where you know you have to pull your little ticket out of the machine to get a number to wait your turn? Here at the college, I, do they, I don't think they give you a piece of, they still give you a piece of paper, right? For your number when you're waiting in line. But if you go to, say, Service Ontario, they still use those stupid rolls. You know, you pull it and like three come out. 98, 99, 100. Oh, I guess I'm 98. And you put the other two in your pocket, right? So you've got the one in your hand and two have been discarded now. Or you do like my son. He goes, 100, that's great. Puts the other two in his pocket. Because then, then the workers have to call out 98, 99 anyways. And he just thinks that's funny. My son's a bit of a jackass. But that's what's that happened there. Is you basically you pulled out two, two numbers out of the machine. One was a mistake. It just gets discarded and never gets reused. You have the next number, and whoever's next gets the next number. So I got one and three. So I'm going to show you guys how to use the update statement, and I'm going to modify row with the ID of one. All right, I'm going to run this, and this will also show you can run two commands at once. And now you can see number one got updated to Daniel G. Now you'll also notice suddenly that number one became row number two. And that's something I used just to use to ignore, and then some students started getting upset that I didn't explain what just happened. Um, unlike other database servers, uh, database servers that are safe for financial transactions are kind of clever. They do some voodoo in the background. And what it actually does is we had row one with Dan. Then we had a bunch of other rows. We modified row one with Dan. What it will do is it has, it takes this row, locks it so that it can't be modified. It creates a new row like this called one and then it marks that one as deleted. So that way if this goes wrong, this one doesn't get damaged. With MySQL, it'll go and modify this one and if something goes wrong while it's happening, it's, it's corrupt. Postgres actually creates a new row and then marks the old one as gone. And that's part of proper safe transaction process. You want a database that does this for your money. So database servers that do this are safe for using for money purposes. Database servers that don't do this are not safe for money purposes. Oracle does the same thing. Microsoft SQL Server does the same thing. Uh, the only difference is that they, they hide the fact that they reordered the rows. Postgres figures everybody's smart enough to not panic about the fact that the row order changed. So I modified a single row, and let's say I said, oh shoot, I forgot to include the email address. And I guess I must have missed my last quote mark. And I'm going to change it back to, I'm going to make this one like this. Now, something else you might have noticed. I broke my statement over multiple lines. That's totally allowed. It ignores carriage returns. You can just write your SQL code any way you want. It cares about where that semicolon is. So you can break your comp complex SQL statements over multiple lines so it's easier to read. So you can read it this way instead of one long wall of one long line of text. And you can run it. So I'm going to run this command. And I modified two rows. 
Ta-da. Two rows modified. And that's essentially how you do an update statement. There are more complex update statements than this, but this is the most common one you'd use 95% of the time. 98% of the time. Okay, delete. This is what you use to get rid of the data. Delete from table where conditions. In other words, you delete from the name of the table where, again, feed it a condition, and you run it. Gone. Now, just so you know what Postgres does, is it goes, oh, we want to delete number one. It marks it as deleted. It's not deleted. It's marked as deleted. A little bit later, the maid comes through, and literally, it's called vacuum, and the database server vacuums the table. And it looks at all these dead rows that have been marked as dead, and then it actually empties out that space. So then now they're gone later when the database server decides it's time to clean up the house a little. And it vacuums the table. That's specific to Postgres. Uh, MySQL does weird stuff every once in a while. It'll actually rewrite part of the table, which is also dangerous. Uh, most of them behave pretty much like this. Uh, vacuuming is also known as garbage collection. Um, so when you're learning Java, you learn about garbage collection, theoretically. Uh, or if you, have, if you haven't learned about it yet, you'll learn it later. Uh, garbage collection is when there's stuff left in memory and the programming language actually cleans the memory space for you so it doesn't leave crap back there. Imagine, for those of us that have kids, it's like you walk into the house, kid makes a mess, and magically 20 minutes later something cleans the mess for you and you never even knew it happened. You just come in and the house is clean and you wonder where your children are. And you realize, oh, they're gone for a week. But, you know, not quite. So I'm going to show you guys the delete. And I'm also going to show you the truncate, uh, which I think is, um, truncate, like I said, is dangerous. Somewhere I lost my mouse. Okay, I'm going to run this. Just a few times to show you guys that there's data in there. So I got a bunch of the same thing. And I decided I wanted to delete row number four. Or ID number four. And I'm going to run this. So this one should disappear. This one right here. Gone. And that took... 12 milliseconds for it to get deleted and retrieve what's in the table. So literally, it was done before my mouse button had actually reached all the way back up from the click. If you think about how fast that actually just happened. Now, if you were to do a delete like this, it would delete everything that's inside the table. Gone. But really, I could do this, and 22 milliseconds. That was the time it took to rewrite the fact that this table is empty. The way the trunk it does, it literally looks at the table and says, see this space right here? There's nothing here. It actually rewrites a new file, usually with the definition of the one that marks the old file as dead. So the data is still there. It's just it's been marked as not there anymore. Uh, for those of us that are slightly older and that might remember computers back in the day when we had to use DOS, and I don't think there's anybody in this room that's old enough to remember those days, or either that or you didn't use a computer back in those days, that's how DOS deletes files. Actually, that's exactly how Windows deletes files. That's when it doesn't put it in the trash bin, that's exactly what it does. It marks the space as empty, but the data is still there. Theoretically, yes, with a hex editor. You actually have to open up the files on disk and move them and retrieve the data out of them. It is very, very, very hard. And you're better off trying to recover from a backup. 
tr like I said, truncate is dangerous, 22, se 22 milliseconds. The other one took 12 milliseconds to delete, a, delete it and retrieve the data. This one took 22 milliseconds to delete. Whether it was 10 rows or 1,000 rows, it'd still be about 22 milliseconds. It's instant. Data's gone. Okay. I know. I mean, it's the same thing with painting a house, right? You could either use a little paintbrush and do all the edges properly or just take the can of paint and go poof. And then take the roller and go, oh, that looks good. That's pretty much how I painted my bathroom during the break. It's like, yeah, that's good enough. I hate painting. But essentially, that's the difference between using a nice little brush to do the edges or just using a roller and saying, ah, oh, I don't care if the edges are smeared. It's truncate is very easy. It's two words. It works. And it's like saying a nuke is a good way to kill a bird. Sure, we got rid of the bird and half the countryside with it. And every bird for 100 miles around. The other one, you know, poop, bird down. So, yeah, this one's easy. And it's not something you use on a regular basis. Normally, you don't empty tables every time you do something. This is usually used for data loads. So, for example, you've got a bunch of data being imported. You truncate the import source for the, the import table first populate it, and then migrate the data to its final resting place. Or you have a table that's purpose is for logs, and you need to empty out all the logs, you'd run a truncate on it, and you'd clean out all the logs. Truncate is not something you'd use on a day-to-day -day basis. I can count on my hand, on a single hand, how many times I've used it in the last three years for legitimate purpose, business purpose. I've got five fingers, and I could count all the uses on one hand. But I do show truncate because it's part of the language and you should be aware it's there and you should be aware of how what it actually does to you. Okay? All right, so that's... Oh, I got to show you guys one more command. I said I was going to show you guys the drop command because what was the point of using the drop command before I finished off the rest? And if I go run... milliseconds on my laptop which is currently recording high definition video so gives you an idea how fast we'd be on a server uh, drop table is instantaneous everything inside of it is gone uh, the only way to get it back is recover from a backup or stop the server extract the files etc etc uh, but the thing is, is Postgres is really, really fast. Those files were marked as dead, and it's probably already been deleted off the file system by the time you notice you did something wrong. The garbage collection will come around and say, oh, these files aren't needed anymore. <laughs> Gone. Um, pretty dangerous. So you want to avoid doing that as you can. All right. So what I just showed you guys is everything you need for Lab 6. Not Lab 5, everything you need for Lab 6. So, you're supposed to be working on five, but you can probably get a head start on six. All right. I'm going to start on the next slideshow, uh, because that's actually what I was planning to cover today. <laughs> okay. Uh, no? Wrong slideshow. It's the same one. I want this slideshow. Okay, the select statement. This is the universal by <laughs> It's nothing like being called out when you walk out of class early, eh? <laughs> um, select statement. It's used to retrieve the records from the database. You've already seen me use it a little bit when I was proving to you guys I added the records and modified the records and deleted records. You know. It's the only way to check if the stuff actually happened is to use the select statement. It is very, very flexible. Um, it's made up of two, three, four, you know, like six parts. There's actually six parts to the select statement, but you only need to use the pieces that apply. And today, I'm going to focus on the first three parts. Um, 
if I even get that far. Now, the most basic part of the select statement is field list, table list, conditionals list. So when you think about the SQL statement, that's basically how it's always put together is field list, table list, conditionals. And those three is the core of the select statement. Now, when we talk about the field list, there are two options. And the language is broken down with the field list is what comes after the word select. So you're telling it, in this database, select the following pieces of information. And right now you haven't even told the database where it's coming from yet. But you're telling it, these are the pieces of information I want. And there's two pieces, the star, which means grab all available columns. So it'll go select star means give me every available column that's going to be part of this query. Which is fine if it's only two or three columns, like select star from example, for example. That will give you three columns, the ID, the name, and the email address. It's not a lot of data. Or you can define the field list specifically by separating it using commas. So you could do a select star or select ID and name. Now select star is fine for the most part when you're first starting out because you're not always sure what the data that's in the database is. Sure. After a while you'll want to get more precise. And the other reason that you might not want to use star, in other words use the specified list, would be let's say I actually just want a person's name and email address and I go Give me everything you know about yourself. And you're going to go blah, 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 blah for half an hour. In the meantime, all I wanted was your name and your email address. And I like using that example, that half hour of, you know, of this. Um, because often database servers don't reside on the same computer that's actually processing the data. For example, how many of you have gone to a website today? We've all gone to a website today. If you haven't used a website today, I don't know what you're doing here today. Odds are you went to Blackboard or Axis or you know you checked out the strike information or you played Golf Clash on Facebook. Whatever works for you. Problem is that the part of the server that renders the web page for you is rarely the same machine as the database server. They're sitting on two separate computers that are specifically designed to handle that task. If you do a select star, you're telling me, give me everything you know about whatever the, I choose for the rest of the query. And you could be transmitting, for example, the ID is 8 bits. A person's name is 50 bytes. Their email address was 150 bytes. Right, so right now we're sitting at 200.5 bytes for every row of information. I know that doesn't sound like much, but let's go. Suddenly we're not talking about bytes anymore, we're talking about gigs. Like I mean, I'm talking, you know, this is only a three-column table. Now imagine if that's table, like what Facebook has about you, your name, your, your age, your address, all that stuff. Your row alone could be a meg of information times one million rows. That's a gig of data. So what happens is you're trying to transmit a gig of data through a hole that big, right? It's a bit like when you pull the plug out of your bathtub. The water doesn't disappear instantly. It has to slowly go through that hole and it. There's no, it eventually will go through, but it takes a while for it to all go through. So it'd be the same thing where I said, okay, I will tell me everything about each and every one of you. You each have to take your turn telling me about yourself. You spend half an hour telling me about yourself, each single one of you. So if I started over here, you'd be still here tomorrow morning, right? 
Whereas if I said, give me your name and email address, how long would it take for each of you to just give me that little bit of information? I'd probably be done in 20 minutes to give you guys a more, you know, human example of how that behaves. So select star is good for when you're starting out, as in you want to know what's inside the table. In a production environment, you never want to use that. You want to actually specify the fields that you want to retrieve because you're going to retrieve less. And the less that you retrieve, the faster the query runs because it needs to transmit less information. Does that make sense roughly for you guys? All right. Now, after the select statement, we have to have a list of tables. So, so far we did select star. The next one, the next word you see is from. Then you tell it where to grab that information from. So if I said, give me the ID and the name, select ID comma name from, then you have to tell it where to get it from. So that would be comparable to say, give me your name and email address, but it didn't ask if it was asking from the students, from the staff, from the support staff, you know, from security. Who am I asking? I don't know who I'm asking. I'm just asking out there, give me this. You have to tell it who you want the information from. And that's the from statement. Now, there's three kinds of table lists. Today I'm talking about the first one. So you're going to grab from a single table. You've already seen this. I did select star from example. Boom. Done. There's joins. That's going to be covered in two lectures. Derived tables, two and a half, three lectures. But the short form of it is from, for example, test or from example. <sighs> I got to check my time. Lots of time. Now, the conditional is known as the where clause. So, so far we had select. What do we want to select? From, who am I asking? And now I'm going to specify, I only want to ask people on the right side of the room, from my perspective. Okay, That's what the where clause does. It specifies your target of what you're going to retrieve. And it's done using a series of Boolean oper expressions. So what's a Boolean expression? It's a piece of Boolean math. It's something that evaluates to either true or false. There's a several ways of going around to get your true and your false. But it always evaluates true or false. Uh, there's several operators. You can have multiple clauses and brackets do get involved. Now, I'm going to go through the first set of operators. These should look familiar. The normal set is very similar to C-like languages. So, same as JavaScript, same as Java, same as PHP, C sharp, C obviously, C++, they all share the same operators for the most part. Less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, not equal to. Equality check, as I mentioned earlier, is a single equal sign. Why? Because that's what it was decided in the 1970s. They didn't go with double equals. Don't ask me why. I don't know. They decided equal was cool, and it's all good. Now, not equal can be written two ways. This one you guys have, might have seen. If not, you'll see it soon enough. I don't know who's teaching you guys Java, but, yeah. but that's not equal. But as I mentioned earlier, we used to have diamond, this guy. The diamond operator. Diamond operator means not equal, ever. Because it's impossible for a value to be less than and greater than at the same time. That's what they gave us with that. And then somewhere along the way, all the database servers implemented not equal, and magic happened. Okay, those are the standard operators. There are a few other operators. There's in, and a lot of people like in. In is for inside of a list, so you can give it a list. And as part of your labs, some of this is the stuff you do, this will be lab seven, just so you know. Oh, this is prepping you guys for further down the road. Uh, this is the start of lab seven, I should say. In a list, one, two, four, five, six. It'll give you anything that's one, two, 
four, five, six, but it won't give you three, it won't give you more than six, it won't give you less than one, it'll give you whatever is in that specific list. It'd be as if I called you out by student number. And I want the following students to stand up and I give three numbers out. Three people stand up. Between. Between does an inclusive check between two values. So ID between one and four, it'll give you one, two, three, and four. It reads like an English statement. Give me an ID where it's between one and four. One, two, three, four. There is no exclusive between. In other words, I want everything between one and four, but not including one and four. There's no there's a way of writing that, but not a nice way. Um, there's the is statement, which allows you to check for null nulls blah, for nulls or booleans. Is null, is true. Because something is never equal to null. It's impossible to be equal to null because it's null. You cannot be equal to something that doesn't exist. The only thing that can be equal to something that doesn't exist is something else that doesn't exist. It's impossible. So you can say, is it null? Is it not null? Which is the next operator, not. Not modifies the special operators up there. You can say where ID is not in this list. The ID is not between 1 and 4. And that will give you everything but 1, 2, 3, and 4. It won't give you 2 and 3. It'll give you everything but 1, 2, 3, 4. And you can say is not null or is not true. Which is actually really dumb because you should write is false. Uh, but, as I s said earlier in this term, uh, approximately six weeks ago, um, Booleans are special in databases because they you have true, false, and null. So you got yes, no, and I don't know. So if you say where it is not true, that means if it's false or null, those get caught. So this is where suddenly you get this weird is not null or is not. You get to go is not false. For those of us that love double negatives, is not false. That means they give you all the trues and all the nulls. There is a purpose for it. I don't think there's a single question anywhere in the rest of the term that's going to require you to wrap your brain around that one. But that's what is not is for. And I am going to give you guys a few quick examples of that. And this is the ThinkCube database. I'm going to make it bigger. Hold on. All right, so select star from customers. You guys haven't actually played with the data that's inside the ThinkCube database. You have the structure you imported it, but you haven't played with it yet. This is the inside of the ThinkCube database. There are 10,100 customers in this database. Do you notice that took 1.1 seconds to retrieve? Because I did select star from customers. I said, give me everything you know about customers. Give, me, give it all to me. So that was like the example before. I said, okay, now tell me everything about yourself just because I want your name and your email address. And I just, it just starts walking through one after another and you give it all to me so it takes forever to show up. Now, if I, on the other hand, if I were going to go Like such, name, comma, email, and I hit go. So remember that took 1.1 seconds. 377 milliseconds. So that took 0.37 seconds. So a quarter of the time, well, a third of the time to retrieve it. Significantly faster, correct? The more data you deal with, the faster this is going to. The difference will start to show. Now the other thing is I want to show you guys 
is the where clause. So for example, I want all the IDs, all the customers have an ID between 101 and 125. And here's my 25 rows. And you're saying, well, why is it 25? It's 101 to 125 because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I should have done a smaller set of numbers. If you count it, it is 25. So that's inclusive. And as you can see, that took 14 milliseconds as opposed to 337 milliseconds because we're retrieving significantly less data. That's how you use the between. Because I didn't ask for it. See, the ID is not here. If I add the ID here, there's the ID. Because I was asking for a smaller subset. And some people will say, well, suddenly you're asking for more data, but this number went down right here. Right down, took whatever it was, 14 milliseconds. This one took the 13 milliseconds. And I've had students call me out on that discrepancy of one or two milliseconds. Let's say I ask you to do a job, and as soon as you finished it, I asked you to do the same job a second time. Would you do it faster the second time you did it? Why? Because you've already done it. Database servers cache results. In other words, it looks at queries that it's run recently and keeps a portion of them in memory. And it's just like if you have three separate jobs and you do two often and one not so often, the two that you do often will happen faster than the one you don't do regularly because your brain knows how to do it. Same thing here. So that's the database server caches the queries so it runs a little faster. So that means if it's a query that's run regularly all the time, like give me a list of countries, because you know for the registration form or the profile form, that's loaded all the time. It'll pull it faster because it knows how to retrieve the data from there faster. Because it's done it before. And it took the rows off the disk and they're stored in memory. And what's faster, your hard drive or your RAM? Usually the RAM is faster than the hard drive. Unless there's very specific applications. Okay, that's that one. If I wanted to one specific row, I could go ask just for the one. There's just the one. I'm not going to run this at hard, my heart's content, and it'll stay around, you know, that mark. I could say, not equal to 102. What is that going to give me? Everything but that one. And actually, I think that'll cover most of the examples for now. See, 10,099 rows instead of 10,100 rows. Okay. I'm probably going to call it there for tonight because, you know, it's your first time back after five weeks and your brains are probably not ready for this yet. Uh, you have everything you need to be able to do lab five, lab six, and theoretically start on lab seven. I don't start on lab seven, okay? Just don't do it yourselves. But you have everything you need to do lab six and lab five. And I will be sending Cheryl some answers and some some things you can help you guys prod yourselves through lab five. Um, next week I'll be picking up right from here without the 20 minute preamble about how much 